Oh, here we go. Very boring title slide here. Anyway, um, I'm going to talk about GNU CAP, the GNU Circuit Analysis Package, and I'm also going to talk about how analog simulation works to some extent, uh, to, the, to the extent that I can do it within the allotted time. Um, so let, let's start out with about, well, all right, here, here's the outline. So let's start out with um, how analog simulation works. Uh, all right, analog undergrad circuit theory. Everybody remember the circuits one course, the DC analysis, where you nodal analysis? That's the basic idea here. Um, now, in, in, the case, in the case of how a simulator works, you, you, you take that principle and you apply the principle of superposition to, to stamp the numbers into a matrix. So if I have a circuit, let, let's make a current source here. And let's put a resistor here, and let's put a resistor here. I have two nodes, and let's call this. Re let's make this resistor uh, 100 ohms. R1. Let's make this R2, and let's make that 50 ohms. I, w I would stamp these. At, if you're doing a nodal analysis, you you'd write the equations. If you're doing a simulation, what, I'm gonna, what we do is we go over the net list and you stamp it in. You apply this principle of superposition. So, so R1 goes from 1 to 2, so I would, I would take 1 over 100, put it here in the matrix, 1 over 100, put it here in the matrix. Column, column 1, 2, row 1, and co row, row 1 and 2, column 1 and 2. So node 1 corresponds to this spot in the matrix node 2 to this spot, and the connections between them would be on the off diagonals. And so, so, the, so this resistor would, would kind of shove that into the matrix. If, if you actually look at writing the equations, you'd come up with this. And likewise, the second resistor here, this goes from node 2 to ground. I'd just add it here. So here's the matrix that I'd solve. To, to, to do a DC analysis. And, and this, is, this is basically how it all, all works. Is we're, we're starting with undergrad circuit theory and, um, and taking a component at a time. Take this component, this component, this component, and, and you add it up to the matrix. And then we solve it. And um, now, in terms of the status of how many simulators got this far, hey, this is something I'd give as a homework assignment. Uh, Nonlinear DC analysis, it gets a little more complicated here. What we do is we'll substitute a linearized equivalent. You didn't give me an eraser. You substitute a, li a linearized equivalent here. And um, if I have a diode characteristic, you know what a diode looks like. I I'll I'll essentially make a resistor that makes the tangent line at my guess at, at the operating point, and I'll stick that in the matrix. And um, so I'll have a, a resistance, and the intercept here, or, or is it this intercept? I forgot which one it is. Gets put on the, on the right side as, as a constant. And um, since, since I kind of guessed where to put this, I might have guessed wrong, so if I guessed wrong, I'm going to try again, and, and try, try again, and try again until I get it right. And um, that, that, that iteration is called Newton's method. It's the way we do it. And pretty much every, every simulator does this with a DC analysis. And you know, it's kind of it's standard. Uh, the, the AC analysis, the AC analysis is essentially the same thing. Except with complex numbers, where where we'll we'll do a um, uh, if you have a resistor, it's pretty much the same. If you have a capacitor, you do um, the, the the J omega C thing, and and you get the complex number to stamp into the matrix, and and so it's solved for every frequency. And um, now, in the case of a linear AC analysis, that's pretty much what it is. In the case of a, in the case of a nonlinear circuit, like we have transistors or diodes or something like that in the circuit, 
you, you get this operating point. You get the, the, the actual slope because the, the slope of this curve is, is essentially the resistance or the actual value of resistance, capacitance, whatever you're going to use. You get that from the DC analysis, from the, from the iteration of the DC analysis. So it kind of it, 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 it comes as a byproduct of, doing, of computing the operating point. And, and so when you have an AC analysis, the AC is a linear analysis. But for a nonlinear circuit, you get the linear approximation at the operating point. Every simulator does this, pretty much. Now, a, a transient analysis, you can think of it as being like DC, but you step it in time. We're going to do a DC analysis, and then we're going to do another DC analysis, and we're going to do another DC analysis. We just keep moving ahead in time. And, but in terms of something like capacitors, we'll, we'll use a of a finite difference approach to computing what to put in for capacitors. And what that pretty much means is that if we look at the map, the, the, the map here, we, we, have the, we have the, well, the definition of a capacitor, I equals CdV dt. Now, I can approximate this by, instead of the actual having the derivative, I'm going to make some approximation of the derivative. And I've chosen here to make a very crude approximation of the derivative, where I just take v0 is the, is the voltage we're solving for, and v1 is the voltage at the previous time point, uh, divided by the time we're solving for and the time of the previous time point. So this difference here is the time step. And uh, so I, I, I can make that substitution as, as an approximation of the derivative. And mostly they use a better approximation than this one, but I think but this is a good one for a classroom because it's simple. Uh, this one is called Euler's method. Um, but uh, so if I take this expression and I rearrange it a little bit, I can get it into this form, where I have um, I equals c over h times v zero minus c over h v one. The h is the time step, and this part here is a um, Let's call it a time-dependent constant, meaning that uh, for, for this particular time point, it, it, it's, it's something I computed from the previous time point. So, it doesn't, so I can treat it as a constant for now. This part here, this V0 is the voltage I'm solving for. And this C over H, hey, that looks kind of like a resistor. So a capacitor is a resistor in parallel with some kind of a current source, or maybe a resistor in series with a voltage source. Take your pick. They're really equivalent. And um, as I step through in time, I, I just keep updating this source to, to represent, the, the, re, to represent the, essentially the initial condition, or not really the initial condition, but the condition at the previous time step. But, but this resistor part is what I stamp into the matrix. And um, now, and, and inductors are similar in the sense of how, how the, they, you can essentially substitute a resistor and a source for an inductor at, at a particular increment. Now, of, of course, um, it gets updated every time step, giving you the transient analysis. So anyway, um, the transient analysis is essentially like DC in the sense that it's real numbers stepping in time. We'll use a finite finite difference approximation. And the number that I've called h there is the step size, the, the difference between you know, the, 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 the size of the time step. And there's usually some kind of automatic control over the step size. That is, um, it, you, can, you can just specify a step size and say, well, we're going to use this step size. But, but, but every let's call it professional grade simulator, we'll, we'll make some attempt to compute a step size and, and, and just go f and, and use its own. Uh, there's a difference in quality of how well the various ones work. This is one of the advantages of GNU CAP over the others is that GNU CAP, you don't have to give it any clue of what step size to use. It can figure it out. Uh, others, uh, NG Spice, you have, to hint, you, have to give it a, you have to give it something to start with. Uh, and it and it'll figure something out, and it still doesn't always get it right. But um, 
Uh, quex tends to be a more a more steady state stepping that that doesn't that that that, that give, it, it, it's fine for small simple circuits, but it but it uh, but if you give it something tricky, it mess, messes up. I mean, just giving you an idea of how the the how the various ones compare here. So anyway, most simulators do do this. The quality varies. The flexibility varies. In other, what I mean by the flexibility varies is that uh, some simulators, when you do a transient analysis, you you that they always start over at zero. And there there are some others that well, well in, in in GNU Cap you can tweak it. You, I can start it, run it for a while at this time at run it for a while with rough accuracy, then stop it. Tighten up the accuracy and run it some more. Stop it. Tighten up the accuracy and run it some more. So I can tweak it and and interact with it more. Um, okay. Enhancements. One of the things that we haven't one of the enhancements that uh, well o over the basics that just about everything does. Um, if you look at a large circuit, these matrices can get very large, and so. Just about all of the uh, simulators that you'll ever work with use some sort of sparse matrix techniques where they only store the active parts. Because if I have a circuit with uh, a thousand, with oh, let let let's a thousand nodes or uh, or what what I remember my boss for a while was referring to as a small circuit, only a hundred thousand nodes. Um, you end up with with uh, mostly zeros in this matrix. And so um, generally, they'll use some sort of sparse matrix techniques to minimize the storage and so that you don't have to operate on all those zeros. Another enhancement that something specific to GNU CAP is, is an incremental solver. That since, it's, since a transient analysis is solving the same thing over and over and over, now it's not, a transient analysis is not just solving for every time step. But remember, it's nonlinear, so it's also iterating on every time step. So you might end up with, uh, let's say, on the average, maybe five solutions per time step. And so that's a lot of solutions. One thing that GNU CAP does that the others don't do, actually, this is, this is the original fast spice, the original spice accurate fast spice is uh, that GNU CAP has an incremental solver so that it, it doesn't actually solve the whole matrix every time. It'll, it'll just solve pieces of it. Um, in terms of time step control, there's a number of things that they look at to, to determine what time stepping to use. Um, almost all of them use, use something called truncation error a, as a means of uh, time step control. So remember when I when I said that we're going to make this approximation that hey a capacitor is like a resistor and a source, that is an approximation. And if you want accuracy, you got to make your time step small enough that the error that's introduced by this approximation is small. And so uh, the the error that you get from this approximation they call that truncation error. And and so just about everything uses that as a as a um, as, as part of the basis for time stepping, time step control, and other and uh, other methods that some simulators use. One thing that GNU CAP uses, and also uh, the the Cadence simulator Spectre uses, is that um, is, is that the the time step is controlled for curve smoothness. So that if you have a um, uh, let let's say um, it, 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 it essentially how you would how you would control an interpolation algorithm that, so that um, the, the time step is controlled based on the idea that, hey, assume I want to know the voltage halfway between these two time steps. I didn't calculate it, but I want to know, the, I want to know what it is then anyway. How accurate is that? And there's a way that you can get a, a bound on how accurate that is by, by taking the next derivative. And Anyway, GNU CAP does that. Uh, Spectre does that. SPICE does not. And um, and it, it'll tend to give you a smoother curve. Another thing that some of them use for doing time step control is discrete events and and or what what Verilog A might call cross events. That is, if I have a um, a, a voltage crosses a certain point, 
the time it crosses is, is, time con is accuracy controlled. And uh, GNU CAP does that, um, SPICE does not. Uh, and um, as far there are very few simulators that actually do that. And it, it makes a big difference in uh, speed and accuracy if you're doing uh, switching circuits. All right. Uh, S parameter simulation. Th this, is th this is one of the, the big points about Quux, one, one of the things that makes Quux great because it does that, and, and most spices don't, and GNU CAP does not. It's kind of like AC analysis, but it's based on power. It's a linear analysis like AC, but it, it's based on um, the idea is that you have two port blocks. That, that you give the S parameters of the blocks and it, and it makes a calculation based on that. And it, it's, it's used by RF designers mostly. And um, all right, Quux has it. I think Zeiss has it. GNU CAP and NG Spice don't. We're working on it. Um, another type of analysis you might see is something called harmonic balance. This is another thing that GNU CAP does not have. It's a steady state nonlinear. Basically, Basically, you, you do the um, um, you, you you figure out the the nonlinear parameters like you would in a transient analysis. You 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 figure out the nonlinear characteristics at an operating point, uh, but but not just the but not just the first derivative. You figure several of the derivatives of it at an operating point, and then you do something like an AC analysis. That computes harmonics, not just the not just the fundamental frequency that you're looking at, but also harmonics, and it gives you an idea of of the distortion in the circuit. It's it's kind of an approximation of the distortion in the sense that it gives you well harmonic distortion, uh, but um, and and so you you don't get the effect of um, let's say clipping distortion. You you get the effects of distortion when you're in the when you're in the proper operating region of the devices, but you don't get the effects of the distortion that you get when you get when you traverse into different regions. But but that but it's used used a lot by uh, RF designers. Um, digital simulation works completely different in terms of how in terms of the the principles of it. We don't look at nodal analysis at all. We don't look at voltages at all. And in terms of time stepping. Time stepping is completely variable. There, there is no notion of, um, of, of, of a, any kind of steady state, but rather it's event driven. And what I mean by event driven is something happens, you compute. And something happens might mean that um, I, 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 I have a, an input that changes state. And I compute, all right, what's the effect of this input that changes state? And I'm going to queue it up. I'm going to say, well, this is going to be the effect, but it's not going to happen right away because in digital devices, there's always a time delay going through a device. So you don't have any simultaneous equations to solve at all in a digital simulation. Basically, you just say, all right, here, here's a change that occurred. What does that do? And I look at, and I look at the devices that were directly impacted by those, cha those changes, and I calculate them, and I, and I queue that up and say that, well, in in, 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 in 15 nanoseconds, I'm going to change that. <laughs> and so I got another, so I make a note saying that at 15 nanoseconds, this node is going to change state. Well, it's going to have some effects too, so that's going to propagate. And so, so that's the way digital simulation works. And since it's, since it's event driven, since there's only, it only makes calculations when something is changing, it only calculates the devices that change. It runs a lot faster than analog simulation, a lot faster. And it, it's how long it takes to run uh, depends not at all on the size of the circuit, but it depends on the number of transactions. So uh, be, because if you have a if you have a a big part of your circuit that isn't active, that it that it nothing is changing, nothing is happening. The simulator doesn't have any work to do. Um, mixed signal, analog and digital together. You know, some some people will will put um, put gates in their analog library, 
gates and flip-flops and stuff in their analog library. They'll make an analog model. Uh, they'll make a model of it that puts out voltages and stuff. And they say, hey, we have mixed mode. That's not so. Uh, mi mixed signal simulation means that you have a simulator that actually does the digital that I was just talking about and the analog that I was talking about before that together. And it makes a conversion between them. And so the conversions between them, between the analog and digital, well, one, one type of conversion is you have analog to digital and digital to analog. That is, the analog to digital means, hey, we have voltages, we need logic states. And the digital to analog means we have logic states, we need voltages. And um, so in mixed signal simulation, it means you have some mechanism for making those, um, those tr changes, though, that, that interface. And um, depending on how sophisticated you want to get, some of them uh, will do it automatically. Some of them you make interface devices and stuff like that. GNU CAP actually does it automatically, um, which it, GNU CAP has always done it automatically. And it's something that, uh, as far as I know, very few others actually t handle that part automatically. Uh, another issue that comes up is is the uh, time synchronization, and that is that since the since the digital is only actually active at certain times, you, you synchronizing the analog and digital parts can get kind of tricky. And um, but but th this is one of those things that that one of those areas that GNU CAP is actually is actually at the lead, in, in the sense that it it actually had this feature before before even the commercial ones had it because because that's because it was a research project in the area which is how the project kind of originated um, but anyway on, on the mixed signal I really have to point out just having gates in the library yeah, that's not real mixed signal even though a lot of people claim it is um, Fourier, Fourier analysis is another type of analysis you'll find in a in a simulation and um, Basically, what this means is that we're going to run a transient analysis to get, the, to get the results in the time domain. And then we'll do a Fourier transform on the results so that you see um, frequency data. And it's good for measuring distortion, things like that. And so, um, as, and, and, and uh, well, SPICE has it. Um, it's pretty common to have it, but the quality of it varies a lot. And, uh, including how useful it is, and um, a, a lot of what really affect really ha affects the quality of it is um, how good your time step control is in the transient analysis. Because if the time step control in the transient analysis is poor, you're going to get noise in the transient analysis, and the noise is going to show up big time when you do the Fourier transform of the noisy signal, and um, so this is an area where, where GNU CAP's better time step control actually results in a better Fourier analysis. Because actually, uh, well, for one, for one, that another another impact on the time step control is is not just um, uh, not just what the signal is doing, but what do you want? And so if we're going to do if we're going to do a Fourier analysis, and let's say I have a um, Oh, let's say I want to know measure distortion of an distortion of an oscillator. There's a good one, and I, I have a fundamental frequency of let's say it's one kilohertz, and I want to measure up to the um, I want I want to measure the harmonics up to ten kilohertz. Well, okay, Nyquist sampling theory. I need to run the sampling rate at twenty kilohertz in order to get that accuracy, regardless of anything else. So that means that I'm going to be running a time stepping, um, a, a, a time stepping frequency of 20 kilohertz, one over 20k as a time step, minimum time step, just to get the accuracy that I need for the Fourier analysis. Because I might get a pretty looking picture if I don't do that, but but it, but if I don't have that time stepping in the transient, I'm just not going to get that accuracy. I can I can print out the numbers, but you don't necessarily believe them. And so, so knowing what you're going to do with a transient analysis, 
th that is, in this case, the Fourier analysis, is something you have to feed back to the transient analysis to, in to influence the time steps so that you get good results. Because if you're going to do, do a Fourier analysis, you want it to actually do the time stepping at the points you want, the points the Fourier transform wants to have. Uh, if you do it as a completely, completely wobbly time step, where the time step can essentially float, and then you interpolate or, or resample to get the time steps your Fourier transform wants, you're going to lose accuracy. Um, periodic steady state is actually a variant on, um, well, it could be a variant on harmonic balance, or it could be a, a, a variant on the um, Fourier analysis. Uh, the the pop, popular method that you see a lot is, is actually something they call a shooting method, which is based on the transient analysis and the Fourier analysis. And um, as far as the status, who has it, NG Spice actually has a command to do this. Uh, GNU CAP doesn't have a command built in, but you can write a script to do it. And um, the, uh, the, the GNU CAP, in terms of accuracy, uh, I, I don't. I, I haven't had good luck in getting ac getting good accuracy out of NG Spice. I've got, had it maybe let, let's say let's say 40 or 50 dB, but I've I've gotten 100 dB in GNU CAP in terms of the noise floor for the accuracy. And one thing about it is that to give give you an idea that one of the um, if you look at the transient analysis, one of the parameters that you get to tweak on a simulator is something called RELTAL. If you've ever if you've worked with Spice and had to tweak it, you might have noticed the relative tolerance. And, and um, so typically out of the box, you look at the, look at the number for RELTAL, this relative tolerance. That is, uh, between iterations, how close iterations have to be for it to be accepted for convergence. And they'll give you a number for RELTAL of, let's say, let's say the number might be 0 .001. One, one tenth of one percent. You think tenth of a percent, that's good. Well, tenth of a percent, that's 60 dB. So, so if you're going to use a RELTAL of 0 .001, the most accurate your, for, your noise floor is going to be in the Fourier analysis is 60 dB, just based on that alone. If you want 100 dB, you're going to have to use a RELTAL tight enough to give you 100 dB noise floor. And um, now, of course, when I say the 0.001 to give you 60 dB, that's the noise just from that one source of noise. You're not going to really get that good. <coughs> so anyway, the idea of the, peri of the shooting method of periodic steady state is that there's a number of steps in this. It's essentially a transient analysis, a number of steps. Basically, you, you start up a transient analysis, and you let it run for a while. Um, that is, you want to let it run long enough for what the thing you're simulating to reach steady state. Because if you're trying to do something like an oscillator or something like that, you turn on an oscillator and it's going to take a while for the oscillation to start, for it to build up, and for its own limiting to come into account so that till you actually get to steady state. And so, you, so you, you'd let your transient analysis run as the as whatever the thing is you're simulating you reach reach a steady state and then once you're there you give it a shot you say hey i think the frequency of this oscillator is 1 kilohertz it it's um it's 7 kilohertz but i'm not going to tell anybody but i think it's 1 kilohertz so i'll try it to, so i'll i'll start out and and run it for a while i'll run it with the parameters that i think are right for 1 kilohertz and then it says no it's not 1 kilohertz it's 6 and a half kilohertz and so you're going to go, go through a few cycles of that. So there's an extra iteration process where you do, do a length of transient with the time stepping to get something. And, and, um, and eventually you'll home in on the length of time to run, the time stepping to run, so that you're going to get, so that you'll get something at the, um, at the frequency that you really care. So you're going to have to, you, you, you try it a few times. That's what they call shooting. And then, and then once, you've, once you've reached a point where it makes sense, then you tighten up the tolerance and, uh, and actually make a run at, that, at those settings to get you your, your, your parameters for the Fourier transform. That's pretty much what a periodic state in, entails. 
Um, complex models. So far, everything I've talked about has been something I can do with resistors and capacitors. The complex models are really um, resistors and capacitors. The, you take um, basically basically they, you, you, you take your device and you make a subcircuit of it. Resistors and capacitors, some diodes, you know, nonlinear stuff. Well, diodes really just a resistor, and um, you make you make up your equivalent circuit, and you figure out the formulas, the nonlinear formulas to plug in, and so now you have a, a model. And um, y years ago, people would code these models in Fortran or C or whatever, but lately, um, lately what's what most people try to do is avoid that and, and code the models. And the, the, late, the, the best thing to use now really is Verilog A for, for writing your model code. And, uh, and so for that, we'll use a model compiler. And um, uh, a ADMS is a, uh, is a free open source model compiler that, that will generate uh, models for uh, just about all of the simulators. It's something that's common with the, them all. Uh, GNU CAP model gen actually is the, the old GNU CAP model compiler, which I'm uh, trying to update to make it actually work with Verilog AMS. See, what, what happened there is that the GNU CAP model compiler actually predated ADMS. But when Laurent was working on the ADMS, I figured that, hey, I got other things to do. If he's working on that, go ahead, go for it. I'll move on to something else. And so I put mine on the side. And then realize after a while, Laurent says, hey, I'm through with this. I'm, I want to move on. And besides that, it didn't do what I wanted to anyway. I guess I have to pick it up again. Uh, so that's now, that has once again become a work in progress. Um, OK. What, what is there about GNU CAP? The, the basis of GNU CAP is that it, it was essentially a a fast spice mixed mode simulate, simulator. It kind of came out of my PhD research, but um, but the the basis is spice like. It's 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 based on the same same theory that runs spice, uh, with enhancements to do mixed signal, including smart nodes so that it can actually handle the conversion between digital and analog uh, effectively, and then also there is. Um, there are changes to the transient analysis algorithms, um, essentially the original fast spice, including, including the use of cues and a fast incremental solver. Another thing about GNU CAP that is unique is um, the use of plugins. Um, it, it was kind of a shot in the dark at the time we, when, when I first started doing it, but, but having, having done it, it's something that every Every free software project should do this: is convert as much as possible to plugins, and um, the, the because it, it's a way of um, somebody says, "Hey, I have this improvement. I have the, this this new device model that that you should include in your simulator." I look at the code; it sucks, but still, but still, there's some good stuff in there, and I want to be able to make it available. So here's a trade-off: hmm, Do I do I say no? Do I make it not available? when it really is worth making available, or do I include this code that, to be honest, isn't very good and is going to be a maintenance headache? Uh, well, the idea with plugins is that I don't have to make that choice. And so, and, and so GNU CAP actually lives, uh, the actual repository, the development of GNU CAP is on Savannah. It's on the GNU site. But if you go to GitHub, you can just get your account on GitHub. You can develop a plugin for it. Anybody can do this. And, and the plugins are just like native in terms of how they work. In fact, all of the, uh, all of the device models and simulation algorithms and language formats and a lot of stuff in GNU CAP is all plugins. Even what, even what appears to be native is all plugins. It's one of the rules is that anything that can be a plugin must be a plugin. And, and, we, and the project practices what it preaches in the sense that all of these devices are all plugins. And another thing about the plugins that's neat is that you can have um, wrappers to be able to use foreign code as plugins. 
And one of the neat wrappers that GNU CAP has is one that lets it use uh, SPICE models as plugins. And as, by SPICE models, it can use the, uh, the old Berkeley SPICE models. It can use NG SPICE models as plugins. You don't have to modify them at all. Just kind of wrap it, and it works. Um, yeah, that's what I was just talking about. Plugin is basically shared object model with a with a, a dispatcher, which is a lookup method, and um, and so so you can have as many of these plugins as you want. There's no no code in the core that says you're going to have a plugin of a particular type. It just so you you can load it up with models. So. So device models are all plugins. The simulation methods are all plugins. All of the commands are plugins. The uh, the file formats that it reads are all plugins, which means that you have it has a choice of file formats. It'll read Spice format, Specter format, and Verilog out of the box. And uh, Felix is working on the Quex format. And uh, we have a one another plugin that reads a GSchem schematic file directly. And, um, and these can all be loaded and unloaded by the user uh, interactively. And if you have it installed in uh, like an academic lab condition, you can, um, let's say the system administrator installs the basic GNU cap, but any, anybody who has, who's using it can make whatever plugins, essentially make your own custom version. But um, they use a standard DL open interface, and it's basically C++ derived classes is the, essentially how it works. And um, I'm not going to, I, I could go into some detail here, but I think I'm going to save this. One, one, another thing that makes it work is something that I call the dispatcher. That is, when you load a plug-in, uh, just loading it, um, registers it with the dispatcher so that it knows that it's there. Like I might load a plug-in. The plug-in might be a resistor model. And it registers it saying, OK, this is a resistor. And I make another one that says, OK, this is a diode model. And it registers it. And um, that's done when you load it. And so that, that's basically a C++ map you know, where, where uh, the um, associative array type of thing. Look up the name, and it gives you a pointer to it. And uh, and so, in terms of devices, you you have a uh, essentially a single instance as a plugin. And so, you want to replicate devices to build up a netlist. It it clones it, makes copies of it. Some more code. Uh, the plugin type. Some of the things that can be made into plugins: devices, commands. I was just talking about parameter functions for the. Um, um, like you can have dot in spice dot param with some expression. Th those functions can all be plugins. Measure measurement functions, and uh, behavioral modeling languages and all and outputs. It says here, but we don't really have outputs completely working because it's hard. Almost there. And then I, I already mentioned about wrappers, like the like the spice wrapper that wraps a spice model, so that so that GNU Cap can use the uh, C models written for SPICE as if they were native. More wrapper code. Uh, some of the work in progress in GNU CAP. One, one of the hot items going on right now is, uh, we, we call this the GNUXator project. The GNUXator project is essentially a merger of the GNU CAP and Quexator, the, the QX Quex simulator. Uh, essentially hoping to bring, um, because when I look at the two side by side, there's, a, there's good stuff either, either way, and both of them can use what the other one has. So we're trying to bring them together so that GNU, GNU CAP would get the, um, the RF-oriented analysis and models that Quex has. And Quex could get the high performance of GNU CAP and also the plugins and things like that. that that's one uh, hot topic these going on. Another one is updating the uh, GNU CAP model compiler to take, take uh, the Verilog input language so that it can be a replacement for ADMS. And um, one of the reasons for that is performance, because we're not getting the performance that we'd like out of ADMS. 
and uh, then output plugins. And another thing about the plugins is I'm calling them just in time plugins. Just in time means that you have something in your command file that might generate something and say, hey, compile this and use it as a plugin. And so, so something like, let's say, the, um, uh, the, the, the Spice B behavioral source. In Spice, it's interpreted. In GNU CAP, it would feed this off to a compiler, which would compile it and give you C code, C++ code back, which would run a lot faster. But anyway, that's pretty much what I have. Um, so, questions? Yeah. He, he says uh, we do frequency domain analysis and wants to know if we do wavelet analysis. At this point, I think the answer is no. I don't. I'm not really sure, but I don't. I'm not really sure what you're asking about. I I don't do anything conscious. Consciously about it, but I'm not. I'm not sure what it would take to actually do it. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, how would a example workflow look like with GNUcap? So, what could I use as a front end and the back end to analyze the results? He asked, "What would the the operating flow look like with GNUcap in terms of front ends and back ends?" Uh, that's actually one of the reasons for wanting to hook up with Quux, to, because Quux has that nice user interface that makes it interactive. We don't have, I don't have anything like that. Usually, usually what, ha what, what I would do is maybe use some, some schematic program that, that would export, um, either export a Spice netlist or a Verilog netlist. I'm trying to convince the, the schematic programs that they really need to be able to export a Verilog netlist, not just Spice. But um, so I might use something like that as a as a to generate a netlist and then mess with it by hand. And or in, and as far as the output, uh, I've used um, that. That's one of the things that's not real good, real nice, and is is the interface to some of the output viewers, but. It, it generates it generates reasonably readable files that that you you take that and you pipe it to some of the tools. There's one called Gaw, I think it is, that I've used. That that's a waveform viewer, and I, I've used that one quite a bit to view the uh, output of GNU CAP. Uh, there's there there used to be something called G-Wave, which hasn't been maintained. Gaw is kind of a Somebody else essentially picked it up and is maintaining something, and that's what I've been using. But this is what one of the things that's leading to the working with the Quux project to improve that side. Yes. Uh, did you consider uh, uh, solving uh, transient uh, circuits in a symbolic way, so by deriving equations and then generating some sort of C, C++ code to speed up the simulations? It's a niche. Uh, application that some people modeling uh, musical instruments in real time uh, rely on that? Um, the question was about, did, have, have I considered modeling the circuits in a symbolic way? Yes. And the answer is, considered yes. Actually doing something, <laughs> that's another story. It's a matter of the time it takes to do it. But that, that kind of brings up one of the reasons for plugins is that it gives you the, uh, an opportunity to, to play with it and make it available. But also, I'm not so convinced that it would necessarily make things faster. Uh, right. But I have, I, have done, I have done a little bit of work with symbolic analysis, and, uh, which actually um, brings up another related topic, and that is the, the matrix solver in GNU CAP is capable of solving symbolic matrices. It's not just limited to, um, to true numerics. I mean, it, 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 it's a template class so that it'll, it'll, it'll solve it using anything that you can 
provide the right operators for. And, and that actually makes it kind of neat for doing symbolic analysis. I've, I've look, looked into it, but never carried it through. Never had the time to really follow through on it. Yes? Did you say something about system C? Do you run it? I don't run it, but you know, it's one of those things. Oh, he asked about system C. And I, I don't run it, but it's something that I've, been, I've looked at, and I said, wow, this looks neat. We need to support this. And, uh, and it, it just... And I, I look at it and say, well, this is not going to be difficult to support at all, but I just never had the time to do it. In fact, actually, one, of the, one thing that I've considered, um, and again, not had the time to do it, is that, um, that, that system C, mostly it, you just take the code and it, it just would, it, what it would mean to support it is a wrapper, actually, which it looks like it would be actually a lot simpler than the spice wrapper. And... Um, so given the wrapper, hey, it run, look, I could make it so it runs system C native. Well, that if, if that's the case, we get it to that point. And now here's a way of supporting Verilog and VHDL is you take Verilog and convert it to system C. And uh, so I, I, it, it actually looks pretty attractive, but I haven't had the time to follow through with it and actually do it. Yeah. Yes. I more in terms of the development side, how much of the development is done by you and how much, how large of a community is there contributing to it? There, it's a fairly yeah. small, oh, he asked how much of the development is done by me and how large of a community there is. It's actually smaller than I had hoped. Uh, actually, lately, it seems that Felix has been doing most of the development because I've been wrapped up on other stuff. But, um, it, it, so there's somewhat of a community that's doing development. Uh, not not as much as I would hope, and not as much as I would hope the plugins would have brought on. Um, I, I I see stuff popping up on GitHub that I that that looks kind of interesting, but uh, but so there is some. But you want to join the development community? <laughs> Could use some help. Is the simulator multi-threaded? Now, the answer to that one is, um, the, the, the short answer to that one is no. Uh, a, more in, a more complete answer to that one is that the answer is no, but the code is all re-entrant, so that it, it's just a matter of specking out where to multi-thread it. It should not be hard to, multi -thread, to make it multi-threaded, but I haven't had the time to do it. Uh, that's one... Uh, one part of, um, in, uh, of answering that. Another point related to the answer to that question is that even single-threaded, the benchmarks that I've made, it, it beats all the multi-threaded ones anyway. It, it, beat, it beats all the multi-threaded ones using multi-threads with GNU cap only having a single thread and GNU cap still runs faster. And so... Um, so I, I question sometimes how much it would actually accomplish. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Anything else? More questions? Yes. Can can you speak up a bit? Is it possible to do multi-domain simulation? I'm not really sure what you mean by that. Well, if you want to, you need electrical domain to power the motor, and then you have mechanical domain with the domain of the motor. Um, I'm not. I mean the AMS extension that you can handle multi-domain. It it does, it it does have a built built-in conversion between analog and digital, in that sense, and uh, and it and it of course has the plugins, which should make it at least possible to 
add that. Now, in terms of multi-domain, if you're thinking of something like the different disciplines in Verilog, uh, that's really kind of a cosmetic thing. Um, I'm not really sure how to answer that, actually. All right? Yes. Yes. Right, right, yeah. Um, the question is, in the digital to analog conversion, how are the digital devices modeled? And the answer to that is that as of right now, it's fairly simple. Essentially, essentially voltage source with resistance type of model with, with, a, with, a, wave, with a parameterizable waveform. Uh, in terms of um, what can be done, though, is if you look at Verilog, that, that how that is done is defined in Verilog AMS as something they call a connect module. And um, one of the, one bit of work that's a bit lagging because I've had pressure to do other things is to make the connect module itself be a plug-in. And if the connect module itself, thinking of that as a plug-in, you could write a co the code to do anything you want. But in terms of what's actually built in, I mean, what, what actually comes with it is, is pretty much the, um, um, is, a, is a fairly simple model. Because okay. I, I, I could expect uh, transients for realistic. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. And that yeah, that, that's true. And, and one, one thing that GNU CAP does that's actually beyond the Verilog spec is that it can, uh, it, it can actually, the, 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 the architecture is actually designed around the, the, the VHDL concept of separate entity architecture, where it can have multiple architectures for an entity. And it, do, and it does have the provision for switching between architectures on the fly, which can, can kind of handle some of that stuff. But, um, but that's something that really, um, it's something that I was working on pretty seriously a bunch of years ago, and it kind of got dropped, kind of got pushed aside. Okay, I'm afraid we're out of time, so let's thank Gal again. All right.